Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Jordan is a small kingdom in West Asia. It is in the middle of a brutal wave of the Wuhan virus pandemic. Its economy is struggling. It has tens of thousands of refugees from Syria and Palestine. And now it has two warring royals. One is the king, the other is a former crown prince. The prince is under house arrest. So are many top officials. They were apparently trying to build closer ties with the old tribes of Jordan to overthrow the king. And they are said to have support from quote-unquote foreign powers. It's a full-blown crisis for this kingdom. The prince is releasing videos and audio messages from confinement. The neighborhood is going out of its way to assure the king of Jordan that they are not involved. At stake is the security and stability of the entire region. On Gravitas tonight, as we bring you up to speed with the developments in Jordan, we also tell you why this country is so critical to regional stability. Also on the show, more than one lakh cases in India, fresh lockdowns in Bangladesh, more restrictions in France. The Wuhan virus is back with a vengeance, but the UK is opening up thanks to aggressive vaccination. Facebook is in the middle of another major data breach. This time, Mark Zuckerberg's details are among those leaked. LG was once the third biggest seller of smartphones the world over. Now the company is exiting the business. We'll tell you what happened. And in Egypt, 22 royal mummies were paraded in a grand ceremony. You haven't seen anything like this before. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. For the first time ever, India has reported more than 100,000 COVID-19 infections in the last 24 hours, with the state of Maharashtra remaining the worst hit. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Sunday held a high-level review meeting amid a worrying spike in COVID cases across the country. ASEAN leaders are set to meet to discuss deteriorating situation in Myanmar as concerns grow over the rising number of fatalities following the military coup. The meeting will be held at the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta in Indonesia. This as demonstrators in Yangon burnt a Chinese flag to denounce Beijing's support for Myanmar military junta. Protesters were heard chanting shame on the Chinese government. An aide to the Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, has warned that territorial incursions by hundreds of Chinese vessels in the South China Sea are straining ties between Manila and Beijing and could lead to unwanted hostilities. Salvador Panelo, the presidential legal counsel, said the boat's prolonged presence in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone was an unwelcome strain on relations. In a cold-blooded attack, unidentified gunmen in Pakistan have killed an anti-terrorism court judge and his family, including his two sons in northwest Pakistan. Pakistan's anti-terrorism courts were established to hear cases ranging from terrorist financing to the prosecution of perpetrators of insurgent attacks. Turkey has detained 10 retired admirals after a letter signed by more than 100 of them criticized President Tayyip Erdogan's decision to develop a shipping canal in Istanbul. The letter said that Turkey's Erdogan government officials tied to Turkey's history of military coups. Benjamin Netanyahu's hearing resumes in the first ever public corruption trial of a sitting prime minister in Israel. Netanyahu has been accused of bribery, fraud and breach of trust in connection with three separate cases. This as the Israeli president, Reuven Rivlin, has held consultations with political parties on the prime minister's nomination. Nearly 100 people have been killed after flash floods and landslides swept through eastern Indonesia and neighboring Timor-Leste. 
the deluge submerged thousands of houses, leaving rescue workers struggling to reach survivors trapped in the aftermath. Everyone in England will be offered two rapid coronavirus tests every week to prevent outbreaks and find those people not this, this as the nation prepares to reopen the economy and eventually... Former world number one Jordan Spieth has ended a nearly four-year-long title drought on the PGA Tour with a two-shot victory at the Texas Open. The three-time major winner was tied with England's Matt Wallace heading into the final round, but pulled away with a 6-under 66. Spieth ended 18-under for the tournament, two clear of fellow American Charlie Hoffman and four clear of Wallace in third. This is Speed's 12th PGA Tour title and takes him to 7th in the FedEx Cup rankings. Los Angeles Clippers have rooted injury hit defending champions Lakers 104-86 in the NBA. Marcus Morris scored 22 points, Kawahi Leonard flirted with a 19-point triple-double and Paul George bagged 16 as the Clippers built a double-digit lead midway to the second quarter and never surrendered it. The shorthanded Lakers had a woeful shooting night and have now lost six of their last ten games, falling to fifth in the West standings. Rumors of a failed coup, a prince under house arrest, top officials in jail and a kingdom in turmoil. This is the story of Jordan, a tiny Arab nation with ancient monuments and seaside resorts. In a turbulent West Asia, Jordan stood out like a beacon of stability, but not anymore. This weekend has changed a lot. This weekend, Jordan put a prince under house arrest for allegedly plotting a coup. The prince in question is Hamza bin Hussein, the man on your screen, a former crown prince and half-brother of the King of Jordan, Abdullah II. He has released a dramatic video. He says the army visited him and decided to lock him up inside his own home. Today, the chief of the general staff visited me and told me on his behalf and on the behalf of the director general of the general security and the director of the intelligence service, they warned me of getting out of the house and communicating or meeting with people. My security detail, as well as my sons, were pulled out completely and the communications were cut from my house. I am expecting them to cut the last available tool now. I am expecting them to cut it shortly. So this is his side of the story. What does the other side say? They claim that he was plotting a coup against the King of Jordan, that Prince Hamza bin Hussein was targeting the King of Jordan. So the crackdown began on Saturday. Now the movement of the prince has been limited and he's not the only one facing the heat here. Nearly 20 high-ranking officials in Jordan have been arrested. What did they do? Apparently they were also part of his plot to overthrow the king. On Sunday, the government of Jordan revealed the charges against the prince and the gist of it is this. The former crown prince was cooperating with foreign entities to quote-unquote pursue a long-term plot to destabilize the kingdom. As part of the comprehensive investigations conducted by the Jordanian armed forces, the Arab army and the general intelligence department, as well as the Department of Public Security. The security agencies have looked into the long-term activities and movements of Prince Hamza bin al Hussein, Sharif Hassan bin Zaid, Basem Ibrahim Abadallah, and other figures that target the stability and security of the country. The investigations monitored interference in calls, including calls with foreign parties regarding the suitable timing to start steps to shake the security of our steady Jordan. So this is what it boils down to, two estranged royals, half-brothers, vying for the throne. One is the King of Jordan, King Abdullah II. The other is a former crown prince, Hamza bin Hussein. They're both sons of late King Hussein. Abdullah is the eldest, he's now the king. Hamza is the youngest, he was his father's favorite. 
He was made the crown prince after the king's death in 1999, but in the year 2004, the title was taken away from him. King Abdullah transferred the title to his own son. You can now imagine how that played out. We'll tell you more about the family feud in just a bit. But we must underscore one point here. The power struggle never really made it to the surface until this weekend. The royal family of Jordan always presented a united front in public. So when the crackdown began, it came as a shock to many. And it unfolded in broad daylight, laying bare the deep divisions among the rulers of this kingdom. It even caught the locals by surprise. For me, there's no dispute when it comes to the king. Everyone agrees when it comes to him. Whether the government makes the right or wrong moves, this is normal. But we were surprised that this touches higher ranks. There is no dispute over the king. All Jordanians support him. As for the government and the parliament, we disagree sometimes with them. Prince Hamza surprised us. It wasn't expected that someone from the family would be involved. It has never happened before in history. <laughs> I was as surprised as everyone else with this disturbing news. It really caused pain to everyone. We wish for prosperity and progress for Jordan and for the issues to be resolved, as the king said, within the royal family. We hope that everything goes fine and we wish the best for the country. The crackdown unsettled Jordan's neighbors too, especially the claims of a quote-unquote foreign hand in the alleged coup. The neighboring countries lost no time in voicing their support for King Abdullah. A statement from Saudi Arabia extended full support to the Jordanian king. Israel also issued a statement. Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz called the crackdown a domestic issue. But he did say that Israel will do everything they can, and I'm quoting again, to assist Jordan. Similar statements came from Egypt, Bahrain, Lebanon, the Palestinian Authority and Morocco. The United States also threw its lot with King Abdullah. For America, Jordan is an important ally. During the Iraq war, Jordan had cooperated with the U.S. It was also a partner in the U.S.-led campaign against the Islamic State. And for any future peace deal between Israel and Palestine, the U.S. is going to need Jordan's support. And this should explain Washington's position on what happened in Jordan. As for Amman itself, the situation is still volatile. Prince Hamza released an audio recording today saying that he will disobey orders by the army and this poses a direct challenge to the king's authority. The situation is a bit difficult and the guards have withdrawn. The army chief of staff came to me and issued threats in the name of heads of security agencies. I recorded his comments and distributed them to my acquaintances abroad as well as my family in case something happens. Now we are waiting to see what they're going to do. I don't want to escalate now, but of course I will not abide when he tells me you're not allowed to go out, tweet or connect with people and you're only allowed to see family members. When an army chief of staff says that, this is something that I think is unacceptable. Currently we are waiting for a solution. So while the king may get statements of support from his allies outside the country, public sentiment at home may be an entirely different ball game, and this is not going to be easy for the king of Jordan to maneuver. So is this only about the throne? Or is it about settling old scores, or perhaps a combination of both of them? Also, who exactly is Prince Hamza bin Hussein? What is his story? And what about his half-brother, King Abdullah II? He's someone who's always escaped controversy, but by putting his brother in detention, has he revealed just how threatened the monarchy in Jordan is feeling right now? Our next report tells you the family dynamics, the history of Jordan's monarchy, and the ongoing power play. Situated at the crossroads of Asia, Africa and Europe is Jordan, the land of prophets. It has been a bastion of stability and moderation in a historically conflicted Arab world. But a brewing power struggle between two brothers could soon toss Jordan into an existential crisis. It's 11 p.m. 
on the night of the 3rd of April, and I have just been sent a uh, communique that was sent out by the Chief of Staff uh, asking, uh, claiming that I was asked to not contribute to actions that would uh, hurt the security of Jordan. The man you just heard is Hamza bin Hussein, a former soldier, a former pilot, and a former crown prince. And the half-brother of Jordan's king, Abdullah II. Hamza is a popular figure in his country. The 41-year-old is seen as religious, modest, and in touch with the common man. Many admire him also because of his uncanny resemblance to his father, the late King Hussein. Hussein bin Talal was a 40th generation direct descendant of Prophet Muhammad. He ruled Jordan from 1952 to 1999, married four women and fathered 12 children. Abdullah is the oldest son from his second wife, Princess Muna, who is British. And Hamza is the oldest son from his fourth wife, Queen Noor, who is American. Of all his children, King Hussein is said to have favoured Hamza the most. In 1999, when the king died a premature death, Abdullah acceded the throne and in line with his father's dying wishes, named Hamza the Crown Prince. Only to strip him of the right to succeed in 2004 in favour of his own son. Why? In a letter to his half-brother, the king had said, I have decided to free you from the constraints of the position of Crown Prince in order to give you the freedom to work and undertake any mission or responsibility I entrust you with. But Hamza, whom the chance to become king had escaped twice, did not see his disinheritance in the same way. He gradually distanced himself from the top circles of power, often criticizing the Jordanian government over its policies. His royal blood saved him from being targeted. Plus, Hamza did not show any signs of an open rivalry with his brother. So, he was sidelined, not imprisoned, until last week, when the authorities became increasingly concerned with Hamza's efforts to reach out to Jordan's powerful tribal leaders. Public grievances over the deteriorating economy and corruption are on the rise in Jordan. Hamza is said to have seen this as a chance to increase his public standing. But the Jordanian authorities viewed it as a threat to the monarchy, a bid to grab power. So, Hamza bin Hussein has been placed under house arrest. The system accuses him of being part of a foreign conspiracy. But the erstwhile crown prince says his fight is only for human dignity and reform. There is no conspiracy here. Whatever concoction they're attempting to create or whatever narrative that they're attempting to sell, the basic fact is that this is all about uh, human dignity here, freedom from arbitrary government, freedom from invasive security apparatuses and services, and the freedom to live in a country where human dignity and human rights and the human voice are protected and sacred. Jordan is clearly confronting its most serious internal crisis. Public opinion is slowly mobilizing in favor of Prince Hamza. And resentment against the monarchy is on the rise. The kingdom is divided. The crisis is evolving. The next few days will be very crucial. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Now, the Arab world is not hailed into the Game of Thrones. Sometimes it ends quickly, like your T20s. Sometimes it stretches and puts your gauging power to test, like test cricket. The last one was played in the House of Saud. On the 7th of March, the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman arrested the former head of army intelligence, Prince Naif bin Ahmad. He also arrested the younger brother of King Salman, Prince Ahmad bin Abdulaziz. Why? To reportedly quash a potential coup. 
In 2017, princes, ministers and businessmen were arrested and the Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh was converted into a fancy prison. Fast forward to April 2021, a Game of Thrones is underway in the house of Hashim. Jordan's former crown prince, Hamza bin Hussein, is under house arrest. He's been accused of targeting the country's security and stability. Jordan's allies, like the United States, have come out in support of his arrest. Statements have been issued in support of Jordan's King Abdullah, and they have come from the United States, from Morocco, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Bahrain, Lebanon, Kuwait, Iraq, Qatar, Yemen, Palestine, and the UAE. Also, the Gulf Cooperation Council and the Arab League. You could say practically everyone is standing with the king. And their reaction tells a story. The story of Jordan's role in the region's security and geopolitics. You see, Arab countries like Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and the UAE have oil money. Jordan does not have that. What it has is stability. It has a history of building bridges and that is a very precious skill in this region. It is celebrated internationally too. Jordan is considered as a stable partner by many countries. The United States is one of them. The U.S. has given Jordan access to military equipment and aid. American forces regularly train with Jordanians. The kingdom is home to 3,000 American troops. Jordan is also home to more than 2 million registered Palestinian refugees. Like India, Jordan has been able to find the delicate balance of maintaining ties with both Israel and Palestine, instead of pitting one against the other. Jordan was one of the first Arab countries to sign a peace deal with Israel as far back as 1994. That's when it happened. Now other Arab countries have joined hands with Israel and they're aligning together against Iran. You know that story. The Arabs say this is not about the Shia Sunni divide. This is about security and stability. That's what they maintain. And they use the same words in the context of Jordan. Security and stability. Every statement issued by the Arab world says the same. It's like a chorus, and it shows how critical Jordan is to regional stability. That's reason number one. Here's the second reason why Jordan is so important. Religion. Jordan is the custodian of holy sites in Jerusalem, including the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site in Islam. It also controls Christian and Jewish sites. Reason number three. Jordan is strategically important. It has withstood the impact of a 10-year-long civil war in Syria. That's in its north. It was also a key player in defeating the ISIS. Today, Jordan hosts 600,000 Syrian refugees. Like I mentioned, there are 2 million Palestinian refugees living here. It also has the presence of the Muslim Brotherhood. And unrest in this country could translate into chaos on its borders and could put the entire Arab region at risk. So while palace intrigues and power plays between rival princes is common in the Gulf region, in Jordan, it is rare. The country has a reputation for stability and making peace. Let me give you another example. Did you know that Jordan was the first Arab state to re-establish diplomatic ties with Egypt? That was back in 1984. As we speak, the Gulf region is in a delicate phase. There is a new oil order brought about by the pandemic, an evolving geopolitics driven by a peace deal and a common enemy, and a new American leadership that is vetting the West Asia policy of the old regime. Now is not the time to have the anchor of stability shaken. The Arab world cannot afford it. Jordan's royal family has a reputation for successfully handling every crisis at home, but how it handles the power play in its own palace will shape the coming days of the Arab world. It will also affect the West Asian policy of your country, no matter where your country is, no matter which part of the world you're watching us from tonight. And that's exactly why Jordan was our cover story tonight on this show. On Sunday, the world celebrated Easter, a festival commemorating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But for many in Colombo, the festivities were marked with grief. It's been two years since the Easter bombings, a series of coordinated suicide blasts carried out by Islamist terrorists. They were the biggest terror strikes in the country in at least a decade. Churches were desecrated. Several luxury hotels were, were, were attacked. A total of 279 people were killed in Sri Lanka. But the government is yet to punish the perpetrators. Two years and zero prosecutions. The question is why? Our next report explores. On the 21st April of 2019, Sri Lankans woke up to the news of a terror attack. A little before 10 a.m., a blast ripped through St. Anthony's Church in Colombo. Worshippers attending Easter Mass were targeted. 
Minutes later, another place of worship about 30 kilometers away was hit. A blast took place at St. Sebastian Church in Nagombo. And then it was the Sion Church in Batikaloa. Terror also struck three luxury hotels in Colombo. The Shangri-La, the Cinnamon Grand and the Kingsbury Hotel. At least 35 foreigners were killed in the attacks on these hotels. Hours later came the seventh explosion. A hotel near the National Zoo in the Dehiwala area, a Colombo suburb, was attacked. An eighth blast hit the suburb of Orugadawatta in the north of Colombo. Eight attacks in just over six hours. As the Sri Lankan government sprung to action, our team traveled to Colombo to find out what had happened. But little did we know that the crisis was far from over. Another bomb went off at St. Anthony's Church, as our correspondent Sidhan Sibal was reporting just a few blocks away. Watch again. With the security apparatus clearly having failed, the Sri Lankan police launched a crackdown to control the damage. Raids were carried out, suspects were detained. The initial probe found the attacks to be the work of religious extremists. All associated with the national Thawhid Jamath, but the arrests did little to allay the fears. Sri Lanka remained in a state of emergency. On the streets of Colombo, the fear of another attack persisted for days. This is a very congested area of the city and shops have finally opened a week since the blast. People have come out. Uh, people are still wary. People are still looking at uh, security officials. You see that van, a police van uh, with, with armed personnel. And uh, this has become a common sight in the city of Colombo. Everywhere you go, there are frequent checks. Uh, cars are stopped, vehicles are stopped. Your uh, eye card is asked for. And uh, this has become a way of life. Adding to these fears was the ongoing war of words between the politicians. The Sri Lankan government was split. The prime minister blamed the president for the security failure. The president said he had no clue. As politics took precedence over national security, we sought some answers from Ranil Vikramasinghe within days of the blasts. I know for a fact that there was a lapse, but whose fault was it? Well, uh, the information didn't flow up and the information that went down was not acted fully. Because if the information that went down was acted on, you could have prevented all the blasts, or at least many of the blasts. One of them could have taken place. There are claims that a political conspiracy could have led to these lapses, and this is a very serious claim. Do you believe this? And more importantly, are you going to investigate a charge like this? If there's any evidence of political in conspiracy, yes, we will inquire into it. At the moment, we are looking into lapses in the system itself and inactivity. The 2019 Easter massacre exposed the fault lines in Sri Lanka's politics. The intelligence was there, the information was there, but the disaster could not be averted. Even today, politics seems to be stalling the judicial process. Last month, a presidential commission report was released. It blames the former president and the former prime minister for failing to act despite intel inputs. The exercise has become more about settling political scores. As the 200 people who have been arrested in the case wait for their turn to face justice, two years and zero prosecutions. Only a lot of political blame game. Bureau report. We own. World is one. If geopolitics were a sport, treaties and conventions would be the ground rules. They ensure fair play. But if you're a rogue leader like Turkish President Erdogan, then treaties are nothing but chains. They dent your global ambitions. Last month, President Erdogan abandoned a treaty on gender violence. Apparently, women's safety is a distraction in power plays. But he isn't done yet. Erdogan is planning to violate another treaty. And this one was signed in 1936 during the World War. Under this agreement, the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits were given to Turkey. This is the region we are talking about. Turkey had control, but with a caveat. Only civilian ships would sail through these waters. The Bosporus would not be militarized. That was the rule. 
But rules have seldom stopped President Erdogan. He has devised a workaround. Since he cannot militarize the Bosporus, he is planning to create a completely new waterway, in effect a second Bosporus. It is expected to be a 45-kilometer-long canal to the west of the natural route. But why is President Erdogan building it? The canal is one of the president's grand projects. It's a reimagination of 21st century Turkey. It has already bankrupted the economy and made a laughing stock of the national currency, the lira. But the president will do anything, apparently, for a return to the glory days. Turkish officials say the new canal will reduce traffic on the Bosporus. And they also say that the old convention will not apply. But Turkey's battle-hardened veterans disagree with this. 104 former Navy officers have signed an open letter against the president of Turkey. They say the canal project is a violation of the treaty and that it will harm regional security. But all the president heard was the warning, the warning bell of a coup. The response was swift. Ten retired admirals have been arrested. Their charges? Conspiring against state security and constitutional order. This is how Erdogan's spokesman defended the arrest, and I'm quoting, a group of retired soldiers are putting themselves into a laughable and miserable position with their statement that echoes military coup times. It sums up what's happening in Turkey. Free speech is laughable and dissent equals attempted coup. Since the year 2016, Erdogan sees hostile takeover everywhere. It's the classic sign of a leader insecure about public support. The new canal project is a destabilizing act. For instance, the Black Sea has been historically dominated by Russia, but what if American warships enter these waters? Erdogan loves playing allies and rivals against each other. It's something that he has perfected in his dealings with the European Union. And we could get a glimpse of it on Tuesday. Top officials of the EU, EU, Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel are due in Ankara. And they're hoping to find a solution to the Turkish problem. Here's the issue. Turkey is a candidate for EU membership. But Turkey has disputes with existing members like Greece and an abhorrent record in human rights to boot. So what are the EU officials hoping to achieve here? Brussels is ready to engage, but only if Erdogan takes positive steps. So let's recount what the president has done in the last few weeks. President Erdogan of Turkey has abandoned a treaty on gender violence. He detained dozens of university, university students for protesting. He approved a plan that violates an 85-year-old treaty and he arrested retired officers who opposed the move. If this is Erdogan's idea of wooing Brussels, there is no hope. There is a wide chasm between what the Turkish president says and what he does. Last year, he talked about Turkey's European destiny, but he continues to alienate the EU with aggressive posturing. Many say Turkey's future is linked to Europe's. That's also what the country's founder, Kemal Ataturk, believed. But Kemal Ataturk was a statesman. He believed in international law. Erdogan, on the other hand, styled. His style being disruptive, intolerant as a sportsman. Facebook has suffered yet another breach. Personal data of more than 500 million Facebook accounts has leaked online. Around 6 million Indians are victims of this leak. But that's not the only story here. Among the victims is Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg. His phone number is out in the open. Our next report tells you more. If you use Facebook, it's possible that your personal data has been leaked. That means your name location, your Facebook ID, birthday, bio, and even your phone number could be out in the open. Personal data of 533 million Facebook accounts has been leaked. Facebook says it's old news and that all this data was scraped up in 2019 when a vulnerability left user data exposed. Now the entire dataset can be accessed through a hacking forum for free. Even Mark Zuckerberg wasn't spared. The Facebook CEO couldn't protect his own data. A report says his personal information was also leaked. 
The breach has revealed Zuckerberg's location, marriage details, birth date and Facebook user ID. For Zuckerberg, this won't be the first time when his own platform compromised his data. In 2018, the Facebook founder had revealed that his personal profile was captured by Cambridge Analytica, the political consulting firm that had obtained the personal information of millions of Facebook users without permission. Back then, personal data of 80 million users was breached. The latest breach looks far more damaging for Zuckerberg. A Twitter user shared what the database looks like. Experts believe anyone with rudimentary skills could look this up. While the database is old, cyber criminals can still use it and do some serious damage. They can use the data to impersonate users, even scam them online. For a company that manages the personal data of over 2 billion users, Facebook has been given a lot of leeway in the past. In 2019, America's Federal Trade Commission fined Facebook $5 billion. It said the company had misled users about how third parties, like advertisers, access personal information. The settlement was the largest privacy violation fine in American history. But Facebook wasn't forced to admit guilt. Bureau Report, we on. World is one. So on at least two occasions, Facebook failed to protect the data of not just its users, but even its founder and CEO, Mark Zuckerberg. What does that tell you? You cannot depend on big tech to protect your data. What can you do about this? First of all, you need to know if your data was leaked. And it's easy to find out. There are several online tools available to help you get that information. One of them is, have I been pawned? Here you can just fill up your email address and it will tell you if you were breached or not. This website has a database of more than 10 billion account breaches across the internet. And in most breaches, it's usually less sensitive information like emails or username that are compromised. But if your password has been leaked, you will have to stop using that password anywhere on the internet immediately. You will have to change it on all accounts, all affected accounts, and for an additional layer of security, set up multi-factor authentication on your digital accounts. What does that do? It will add one more step to your login process, usually a unique number code. It is generated every time you log in, either through an app or through an SMS. And you'll be required to enter this after you log into your account with your password. As cyber breaches get more frequent, it's better to be safe on the internet than sorry. So think twice before you share anything that's important to you online. And we have some more news from the world of technology. LG has decided to walk away from its smartphone business. It is the end of an era. Many features that we take for granted in our smartphones today were actually pioneered by LG. They rolled out the first capacitive touch screen. They introduced us to slow motion video recording. But with a dwindling market share and mounting losses, they had no option but to shut shop. Our next report traces LG's downfall and what it tells us about modern day brands. Wacky displays, ultra wide cameras, gesture controls. LG did it all and they did it way ahead of their rivals. Apple can't stop bragging about its stainless steel frames. For LG, that's old news because they did it in 2015. When Sony and Apple were toggling their screen brightness in 2014, LG unveiled Quad High Definition, four times standard HD. LG had managed to conjure magic into its screens. Everyone wanted to own one. By 2013, it was the world's third largest smartphone maker. But then things went south. The market was becoming more competitive. Apple and Samsung were making durable phones. Devices suited to our multitasking lives. LG just couldn't keep up. Its phones struggled with hardware and software issues. Users grew tired of staring at the buffering bezel. They abandoned LG. In the last six years, losses mounted. LG bled around $4.5 billion in this period. They were shipping 28 million phones. 
compared to Samsung's 256 million. It was time to call it a day. LG first tried to sell its smartphone business. No luck. Nobody wanted to bet on a sinking ship. So instead, they shut shop, leaving behind an industry it helped build. But we haven't heard the last of LG. Not by a long shot. They still own a thriving consumer appliances business. They are the second best-selling TV brand in the world. The company plans to focus more on robotics and artificial intelligence. It's a bold new era for the Korean giant. But LG's fall is a commentary on our times. The markets change every fortnight. Consumer taste depends on the next advertisement they watch. Market domination isn't absolute anymore. In fact, it's a game of musical chairs. The smartphone industry is known to be a giant slayer. Companies that were perceived to be too big to fall have been shunned to the market fringes. Remember Nokia and Motorola, pioneers reduced to paupers. Loyal customers are an overrated concept. More than loyal, today's customers are wily. They swapped out Yahoo for Gmail and Orkut for Facebook. In the 1990s and 2000s, Blockbuster Video ruled the video rental space. Games, movies, they had it all. In 2010, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. They'd missed the digital bus. In the year 2000, Blockbuster turned down an offer from what was back then a little-known business, Netflix. Then there was Polaroid, pioneers of instant photography. They passed in their initial success, while DSLRs scooped away their customers. The airline industry is another giant slayer. Big guns like Pan Am and Concorde revolutionized flying. But they soon fell into ruin. Remember the first rule of business. The customer is always right. Today, their message is clearer than ever. Innovate or die. LG's bag of neat tricks couldn't hide their slow processors. In this highly competitive world, the only constant is change. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Let's talk about the pandemic now. A deadly second wave is sweeping through South Asia from Pakistan to India and Bangladesh. All countries are reporting a record spike in cases. India reported more than one lakh new infections in a day, becoming only the second country in the world after the United States to hit that mark. Our next report brings you up to speed with the latest. A grim milestone in India's fight against the Wuhan virus. On Monday, more than one lakh cases of new infections were found. The highest single-day figures for India since the pandemic began. At the beginning of the new year, India was breathing easy. But now it seems like the virus has come back with a vengeance. Even with vaccination, Hospital beds are filling up fast and the restrictions are returning. The state of Maharashtra has accounted for nearly 60% of all the new cases in the last two weeks. Reports say 8 out of the 10 worst affected districts are in Maharashtra. The state government has announced a night and weekend curfew. Public spaces like parks, shopping malls and cinemas have been closed again. India's neighborhood is battling a surge too. Bangladesh has decided to impose a week-long lockdown after recording more than 7,000 new cases on Sunday. This is the highest daily count for Bangladesh. Only utility and emergency services will run for the next seven days. Factories can remain open, but they will have to follow strict hygiene rules. The second wave has swept Pakistan too. On Saturday, the country reported more than 5,000 cases. Islamabad says this surge is worse than last year's wave. Pakistan has also become the first country to allow the commercial sale of vaccines. The Russian-made short Sputnik V is now available in the open market. It has been priced at 12,000 Pakistani rupees or $80. A cost price 
that may keep the life-saving jabs out of the hands of the poor, who make up almost one-fourth of Pakistan. Beyond South Asia, Europe is struggling with the third wave of the pandemic. Many countries are reimposing lockdowns and restrictions. Last week, France announced its third national lockdown. Thousands of cops were seen on the streets of Paris on Monday, asking people to wear masks. Those who broke the rules were fined on the spot. In contrast is the United Kingdom, which is gradually opening up. New Wuhan virus cases have reduced dramatically in the UK thanks to its vaccination program. After inoculating more than 47% of its population with at least one dose, new infections are now down to just 6% of the peak that was reported in January. That's when the so-called UK strain had led to a big rise in cases. Three months on, the British government is lifting lockdown restrictions. People can now meet outside. Outdoor sports facilities have also reopened. For the rest of the world, the writing is on the wall. It is critical to vaccinate large sections of the population to beat the surge. And it must be done sooner rather than later. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. With that, it's a wrap. We're leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.